What's up, rookies? Welcome to another snippet on what pharmacies do, where we showcase what pharmacies do and explore inspiring pharmacy career paths. Today, I am so excited to have with us Dr. Kate Cozard. Dr. Cozard is a clinical pharmacist, practitioner specializing in primary care. She's an author, a speaker, an advocate for pharmacy's well-being and resiliency. I have related with you on so many levels, Kate, because you made yourself an expert in so many issues that I have dealt with and continue to deal with throughout my pharmacy career as a pharmacy student, as a resident, even now as a pharmacist, I continue to struggle with imposter syndrome, resiliency, precepting, um, career growth and development psychological safety, all these are terms that you are experts in. So I'm so excited to have you over and talk about what got you started with all of this. And I urge our listeners to pay close attention because Kate is going to drop some amazing pearls for us today. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your Sunday uh, to share these, uh, to share your journey with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I'm so honored to have you. You're a star in the world of pharmacy. So I feel like I just need to get an autograph right now, but I can't do that right now on Zoom. So we'll, we'll figure that out later. So let's start by getting to know you a little bit better. What inspired you to pursue a career in pharmacy and particularly in primary care? So my journey into pharmacy is maybe the most convoluted that you will hear oh. because I had no interest in being a pharmacist. No way. I was actually a high school, I was a high school teacher. Um, you don't know this about me, but I was a high school chemistry teacher and a new school opened about 20 minutes from where I was teaching. So when all of these students start showing up on rotations, a friend of mine who was a nurse at the local hospital said, <laughs> hey, I think you should think about going back to pharmacy school. There's one here in town now. Wow. And at first, I didn't even want to do it because I loved to teach. And so finally, back in the days where you had to take the PCAT, I took the uh, PCAT on a whim. I was like, it's just one Saturday of my life. Okay, fine. I'll take the test. Okay, okay. And then, so then I get the scores and I'm like, okay, I'm really well suited for this. And so it went from, I found out there was a school in October. I took the PCAT in January. I interviewed in April and I started in August. OMG. So you, pharmacy is a second career for you then. Sure is. So you go to pharmacy yeah. school in, what school was that that was opening up? What's the name of the school? Union University is in Jackson, Tennessee. Um, and this was, this would have been back like 2010. So okay. it's been a minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so it's not new anymore, Okay. but it was then. Um, and okay. so I was in the third graduating class that they had. Awesome. Awesome. So that's how you become a pharmacist. And what happens in between graduation and where you're working now? So when I was a PhD, Four, I had my Amcare rotation in March, right before graduation. Mm -hmm, okay. And it was at a small VA clinic. So I worked for the Veterans Affairs. Okay. It was a small VA clinic there in Jackson. And I completely fell in love. I mm -hmm. knew that okay. month that was where I wanted to be. Um, okay. I had an incredible preceptor who cared about his patients and was very committed to training those of us that came on rotation there. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. was like that moment, the light switch flipped. And I said, mm -hmm. I want to do exactly what Dr. Jet does now. Mm -hmm. And so that became the, the plan. Okay. This is where I wanted to be. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, it always takes an inspiring mentor um just to to spark that light for many of us um i can i have that same kind of story for so many things in my life um so i assume you do a residency um with I did. Uh, with with in in uh, with, with the va 
I did. Okay. So okay. I did my VA residency at the Memphis VA in Tennessee. Okay. Um, so that was the base for the outpatient clinic that I was in in Jackson it was what they call a CBOC a community-based outpatient clinic okay. about an hour out from the main hospital okay okay that's okay. actually exactly what I do now I'm at a, mm. the Clarksville CBOC of Nashville okay so okay. I am at in the basically mirror image of what that clinic was to Memphis is okay. what I do now okay okay awesome. now it was not straightforward it was not straightforward though, because when I was a PGY1 in the Memphis area, at least PGY2s and Amcare were not really a thing that that wasn't something that people were doing much of. Yeah. And so I moved to Nashville, having no clue that I was walking into a very PGY2 saturated market. Okay. Um, okay. So I ended up going through the next couple of years and basically doing everything I could to make my expertise known as far as I did my board certification in pharmacotherapy and then geriatrics, did a diabetes certificate, um, made sure that I'd had enough like counseling hours to sit for BCACP and get my AMCURE Wait, certification. certifications? And oh my God. Wow. Okay. Okay. And so... It was actually the month that I got the results back for the last one so that I'd already sat for. But the month that I got the results was the month that I started my primary care career. Um, the couple of years in between, I was doing some swing shift, um, <laughs> internal med, outpatient processing, a little bit of all kinds of stuff, trying to That's position true. myself to get to where I knew I belonged. You positioned yourself, all right? So I was like, I assume you did a residency, but you did two residencies. Um, one residency, three well, board you certs. Have two. No, I didn't have one. That was the oh, problem. Okay. I walked okay. into okay. Okay. I walked into a city where a ton of people had them, but I didn't. Got you, got you, got you. Got you. Okay, okay. So you you wanted to, you thought not having the PGY2, you needed a lot, a, some other things to um, to give you the credentials to to practice as um, exactly a regulatory pharmacist. Okay, so three board certifications later, well, I'm still trying to sit for one girl, <laughs> but three board certifications later, you are now working at the CBOC, at a CBOC in Nashville, Tennessee. Yes. Okay. So we like to find out what pharmacists do, because I like to preach that pharmacists just don't count pills. We work in so many different aspects of healthcare. So what does a primary care pharmacist do? I really like that term because they throw around the term primary care physician a lot. So uh, I love to say primary care pharmacist. What does a pharmacies do in the primary care setting and what specifically do you do in um, your own your own uh, work setting? So for me, I have one of the most independent type primary care jobs because mm -hmm. I work for the Veterans Affairs System. I have my own scope of practice. So I know most pharmacists in primary care work under a collaborative practice agreement, okay. but that's not actually actually the type setting that I'm in. I have my own scope. So most of what I get referred mm -hmm. is either diabetes or hypertension patients. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody that's been a little harder to control, they'll send yeah. to me, say, please help, you know, and I will <laughs> jump in and start, start trying to figure out what do we need to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I also definitely do not not limit myself to that. I do a lot with lipids. I do COPD, gout, basically anything that's primary care related. I have the ability to, and often will pull those pieces in as well, okay. but those are not usually the reason that I get sent the patient. They just become the add on. Uh, yeah. Now, because of the role that I have, I have my own scope. So I prescribe whatever I think is the best, most appropriate option do all of the monitoring, follow up, all of that. So basically okay. I, when I take on a patient, they, they become mine. Um, mm -hmm. And it's so funny because I know 
in primary care especially the system tends to be really overburdened yeah and so yeah. a lot of my patients basically have just labeled me you're my di my diabetes doctor like if it's about that you're the one I'm going to ask. Yeah. I'm going to try yeah. to get yeah. back in and ask the PCP because they know that okay. nine times out of 10, if not more, I'm going to take care of it. Okay. It's interesting that the VA or is it the VA in general or the CBAC in particular that you're with that does not have a collaborative practice agreement? In general, the VA has a ton, like thousands of positions throughout the country of pharmacists that have a full scope of practice where they okay. do not need any okay. kind of collaborative agreement. Okay. okay. So all the provider needs to do is diagnose the patient with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or whatever, and said, I'm sending you to Dr. Cozart. You do whatever you want with the patient. Exactly. That is, that is amazing that pharmacists can actually do that. Um, I remember a professor of mine back in the day saying that um, I had asked him where he sees the future of pharmacy, and that's exactly what he had said, that he sees doctors just diagnosing and then just passing on passing the torch on to the to the pharmacist to because once the diagnosis is there, all that's left is the the prescribing of the medications and the monitoring of them and adjusting it to um, to meet the patient's needs and doing some education, um, around that, which pharmacists are totally capable of doing. Right. Like awesome. who's better situated yeah. to yeah. choose the most appropriate yeah. option. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And I do love too, because I get to do a ton of lifestyle counseling yes. in yes. that role as well. I, you know, yes. I don't just write for meds. I ask yeah. them about, you know, what are you eating? Tell me yeah. about your lifestyle. Are you active? Um, one yeah. thing that my patients always comment on is the punching bag that's like right here behind me because they're like, is, is that a punching bag? I'm like, yes, it is. Because I want them to know that if I'm asking them to do something, I'm committed to doing the same You're thing. Doing it also. I'm not going to tell yeah. you that you need to get 150 minutes of exercise if I'm not. And not do it. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys heard it. Pharmacists can totally be independent practitioners and take care of their patients and use their clinical knowledge um, to do so. So thank you for shedding the light on that, Kate. Of course. Um, now let's dive into the meat of, I, I, I'm just being bad. This is the meat for me, the meat of the conversation. But you are a strong advocate for resiliency and wellness within the pharmacy profession. What led you to prioritize these aspects of um, healthcare for us, the healthcare providers? And I know you also prioritize that for your patients. I think that when it comes to advocacy, mm -hmm. so much of the time we're advocating because of what we needed mm -hmm. in our past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, I had a lot of things that I wish had gone differently. Mm -hmm. I had situations where I was the patient and someone didn't treat me with compassion. I yeah. had yeah. a situation where I had a newborn and then a pandemic hit and I was postpartum in Ugh. the middle of a pandemic going, I can't be mm -hmm. a good health provider. I'm just going to be faking it the rest of my life. And that's when I really started diving deep into imposter syndrome and doing research around like, what is imposter phenomenon and what can I do about this? I've had situations as a learner where I didn't really feel safe. And so psychological safety is something that I talk a lot about. I've had job situations where I was doing swing shifts and burned out and felt hopeless. Guilty. Yeah. So all of those things mm -hmm. led me down this path of, I'm going to talk about burnout and resilience and how to show compassion as a medical provider. And how do we teach that to our learners? How yeah. can we kick these imposter thoughts? How can we create safe spaces for learners now that we're out on the other side and going, whoo, okay. I went through that, but I don't want to be that preceptor. Yeah. And yeah. so 
so much of my passion is forged from the lived experiences that yeah. I've had over the last decade and a half. Yeah. Okay. Many of us um, advocate for things because we go through them in one way or another in our own lives. Uh, many of us think about doing it, about speaking up, about creating programs. I personally have ideas that I can talk about with you uh, on, on a different day, but I've never really gotten to doing so. So I'm so thankful um, that you took on this task, that you became the expert um, on the matter. And, and people really um, need it because you have had several opportunities to speak on these issues and present on these issues and train on these issues. It may have led you to this book, right? Um, participating in writing a chapter in, um, you know, as I speak right now, I wish I had the book and holding it in my hands and showing it to you guys, but I, I, I'm I, definitely planning on ordering it and reading it. It's called Things... Oh, wait. There, <laughs> there it is. Show it again. Show it again. So in, in your book, Things I Wish I Knew About Taming the Inner Critic, what insights do you share with, with readers and that you can share here with us, with our listeners about overcoming self-doubt and achieving confidence in growing in their pharmacy career. When I was approached about this book specifically, I was actually already working on a book about imposter syndrome. And this seemed to really fit with the dynamics of this multi-author work that was happening because self-doubt is something that's not limited to us in pharmacy or us in medicine in general. Mm -hmm. This is something that everyone struggles with. And so that led me to pick out talking about the inner critic as what I wanted to contribute to this book. And so I share a few tools that I think are very, very helpful, especially in the world of medicine, but also in general in life. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about how when I was very early in my primary care career, mm -hmm. I made a mistake. I ordered a medicine incorrectly and I let that moment eat at me, even though I caught it before it got to the patient. Oh, I've been there. Oh my God. But the fact that I could have signed the order and it be wrong was just beyond me. And so I was beating myself up going, no good pharmacist could have done this thing. No. And then finally, I basically confessed and word vomited all over one of my colleagues. I was like, look, I did this and I'm just, I can't get over it. I can't shake it. I cannot believe that I messed up. Mm -hmm. And when I told her what I did, she goes, oh, that's really easy to do. And so realizing that someone that I respect a lot that's further down their career than me had that, oh, that's an easy mistake to make reaction. I realized I am harder on myself than most people would be if they heard the same scenario. And so that led to one of the tools that I use a ton now, which is would 10 out of 10 people agree with me mm -hmm. when I'm beating myself up, okay. when I'm going, no good practitioner could do this. Would 10 out of 10 people agree with that? And if the answer is no, then I know that that is not something that I need to let myself buy into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and in this case, it actually led to a quality improvement scenario once I was willing to admit it and reach out to some of our IT folks and go, okay, look, I think the order here in this part of the menu could be done better to mm -hmm. prevent mistakes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but I wouldn't have ever taken that step had mm -hmm. I not had someone affirm that I was not a bad pharmacist. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if I were to ask 10 people, would 10 out of 10 people say you were wrong? And if the answer is no, just let it go. Yeah. I, I usually just say it, but then if I'm like really not sure, yeah. I ask at least three. 
<laughs> because if I get one person go, oh no, like you are not a screw up, then okay. <laughs> yeah, got gotcha. you. Affirmed. <laughs> Affirmed. Yes, I'm gonna start using that. Um, Anything. Else? Okay. Yeah. Of course, I could go on forever on these. That's, that's um, the three. That's the three. Okay. Okay. Um. So one of the other one that I really stress is talk to yourself like you would talk to someone you love or the way that you would want others to talk to someone you love. So this became a big thing for me once I had a daughter. I was just thinking about my kids as you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, there are a lot of ways that I beat myself up. And one of them is always probably going to be body image. I'm a woman in America. And that's just what yeah. we're bombarded with and so that's been a struggle since I was 13 years old mm. but I know that when I start getting that negative mentality rather than thanking my body for what it has done and what it can do I think back to what if I heard my daughter mm. say to herself the things that I'm mm. thinking right now because yeah. man does that stop me in my tracks yeah. from saying it out loud yeah that's a good one that's a good one okay number three this one is something that I actually thought was really really silly but it helped me a ton and so I'm gonna share it with you I named that inner critic voice oh, so I oh, know oh. Okay. I know, I know that there are certain phrases that tend to be what I tell myself when I'm feeling like I'm not good enough. Um, and this again, comes back to a lot of the body image type things, but I gave my inner critic a name so that instead of trying to get rid of thoughts that are mine, I hand those thoughts over to this like avatar and I'm like, nope, you can go. Like you, you are not welcome in this room. Yeah. Kate's going to stay in this room. Yeah. Okay. But Sam is not welcome. Okay. Okay. And so I have that avatar that I just tell to get lost. Yeah. I'm not interested in her opinion today. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. It reminds me a lot of a book I read by, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name, but he talked a lot about the ego, um, about some of the thoughts that he was like he was going through a really hard time and he was thinking about committing suicide and a voice inside of him was saying, you're not good enough. You're not worth living, something like that. And, and he had an epiphany and said, if this thing is talking and saying you are, because it was speaking in the second person, you are not, you should do this. You should. So it's not me speaking. It's somebody else speaking to me. It's the ego speaking to me. And he calls it the ego. You called it something else, mm -hmm. the avatar, something else. And he called it the ego. And, and he really separated that from himself, saying it wasn't me. It was somebody else. And I had to learn to differentiate who is speaking so that when I need to block out that person, I'm, I'm more easily able to do that. Oh, man, I wish I remembered his name. But um, Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle. Is the name. Okay. And I'm, he's, he's, I'm going to have to hunt that down. Yeah. Oh, man. Anyway, so let me, I'm going to recap the three, um, the three suggestions that you share with us here, because I know it can definitely help me in my person, in my pharmacy practice. Um, first of all, um, if you're having bad, critical, um, judgy, feelings or thoughts about yourself, think about first, would 10 out of 10 people agree with these things that you're saying right now about yourself? Um, would you want someone you love talking like this about themselves? Would you say this to someone you love? And, and then kind of giving that side of yourself a different identity to, to help you better realize that um, it's not who you are. It's, it's this other thing, this voice, this ego, this whatever you want to call it, that's there to self-sabotage. And you have to learn to uh, kick her or him or it out of your, your life to allow yourself 
to move forward with with things in life and with 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 where you want to go i think definitely something that i'm going to start using a lot because no matter i don't know if it ever goes away no matter how much experience you get um depending on what um, experiences you've had in the past they can that voice can still come back and and prevent you from getting to places that you're meant to get to so we have to practice it every day um it's a daily practice to um to appreciate who to who we truly are and be who we were meant to be right um okay not agree more thank you thank you so much our last question is one of my favorites what advice do you have for our audience um who are interested in pharmacy primary care and promoting well-being within their own lives and within the pharmacy profession at large? That is such a loaded question, but I think there, there are really three attributes Mm -hmm. that I think are so important Mm -hmm. when you're trying to navigate this new career path of where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. The first, and especially when you're struggling with imposter thoughts is don't be scared to be vulnerable Mm. because we always think we're the only one in that room Mm. until we admit where we're at and then have so many people come alongside us and go oh I felt that too yeah I've been in your shoes when we can be vulnerable other people can pour empathy yes onto that yes and cure the shame that we're tucking inside okay okay be vulnerable number one that's number one okay probably the most important um the second i think especially in today's pharmacy workforce is be adaptable you never know when something new is going to present itself Mm -hmm. and if you're so set on this is all i'm able to do then it's hard to get out of that mindset and think oh yeah i can grow and and learn this new skill and so sometimes that's being adaptable like i had to do straight out of residency and work a couple of years in a job that was not where I wanted to land, Mm -hmm. but I knew I needed to be in that position long enough to put myself on paper and have people take me seriously. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so sometimes you just have to be adaptable, especially if you were a non-traditional path to the career. Yes. If you didn't do a residency or didn't do a PGY2, you're probably going to have to be even more adaptable yeah. than everyone else. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Be vulnerable. Then, be adaptable. What else? You said you don't, have- I have three. Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. be scared of your creativity. Just because you're in medicine does not mean that we have to be so science focused that we lose that part of ourselves. Yes. I think I, I personally struggled with that. I mm-hmm. am such a creative type person, the creative energy of music and writing and all of that. But I didn't know where to put that when I entered the world of pharmacy. So I just kind of tucked it away for a while. And then finally realized that can make me even better at what I do now. Mm. Mm -hmm. I just have to be willing to accept that I don't necessarily look like every other pharmacist on paper. Yeah. Yeah. I love to to write. I Mm. love to speak. I love to, to be a goofball and go, you know, write, (laughs) write silly poems to get me through the day. Like um, that, that's the type of person that I am. And I could have easily lost that mm-hmm. because that's not the norm mm-hmm. in our mm-hmm. profession. I had to accept that I don't care whether or not I fit in. Boy, this last part about creativity, I 
I mean, my 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 parents were both English teachers in high school, so they're they're into literature and reading and 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 writing. My dad was a poet, and I mean, he loved writing poems. So he was very like you, very much like you. And as a young girl growing up in Africa and and where the African parents, they had that mindset that you had to be a scientific to, to be a success. So it had to be law or math or science or medicine. Um, so I kind of navigated towards that. Uh, but my dad always told me, you're a lot like me. You're a lot of an artistic person. Um, you're just everything that you've mentioned. And I just shoved him to the side. I wanted to be like my friends were doing and I and I went into science and I eventually do be doing what I'm doing now. But, and I think that's where, that's why in the social media kind of saved my life in a sense, because it allows me to express a different side of me that is not necessarily scientific, not necessarily pharmacy. And I'm still struggling with, harnessing that uh, side of myself and incorporating that into my practice and making and growing a career out of it kind of like you've done kind of like you've done with writing books um, and becoming the expert that people turn to for resiliency and and, and authenticity and, and, and confidence and career building and things like that um, I feel like you have done that. You have mastered that. You have you you're you've you've reached that goal that I'm trying to reach, and I'm sure a lot of our audience is also trying to reach. Um, so that's my absolute favorite, and it goes back to authenticity and figuring out who you are and harnessing that energy of who you you truly are and and seeing how you can incorporate that into your practice into your career and into um into your life and i really appreciate you um reminding us of that um but it's definitely what we must do um thank you so much kate for coming on and showcasing what primary care pharmacists do and reminding us that we need to be ourselves even in a pharmacy and for sharing all your treasures and your pieces of nuggets with us today. I really, really appreciate you blessing us with your presence today. And um, to our listeners, if you wanna reach out to Kate, if you have any questions for her, um, She's on social media as The Resilient Farm D, just as it's spelled T E H R E S I. Oh, no, I don't know how to spell resilient. R E S I L I E N T. I will include that in the show notes. Please make sure you connect with her, that you follow her, and they stay in touch with her because you learned so much. Uh, about all the stuff that we've talked about today. Okay, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Let's stay in touch and I really appreciate you coming on. Have an amazing weekend and everybody else stay tuned and on to the next episode. God bless you and protect you. Bye-bye.